प्लीज अगर आप लोग आ जाइए तो वी कैन गो एन एंड गेट स्टार्टेड Thank you very much, uh, everyone. Um, I have a short presentation on something called the Russian digital account, which I hope many of you have heard about. And Payasa will be helping me go through the slides. It's not a very long presentation; it's about ten or twelve slides. And then I'll be happy to open it up, and we can have an interactive discussion about it. Let me just tell you a little bit about the genesis of the idea. About a year and a half ago, the Prime Minister approached uh, the Governor and myself and asked us to connect the Pakistani diaspora to Pakistan's financial and banking system. He, as you know, uh, believes fervently that overseas Pakistanis are Pakistan's greatest asset, and that we have to integrate them into the Pakistani economy in a, in a, in a better way. Um, and so he asked the State Bank to work on an initiative. To try to uh, make it easier for the Pakistani diaspora abroad to connect to Pakistan's banking system and to give them an opportunity to invest in Pakistan and to earn very good returns in Pakistan. And so, at the State Bank, uh, we started working on this about a year and a half ago, and uh, we launched the Russian digital account last September, so about 11 months ago, with the Prime Minister in Islamabad. And uh, I'm very happy to tell you, I'll show you some numbers uh, very soon, that we now have more than 200,000 accounts, Russian digital accounts that have been opened from all over the world, 175 countries of the world. And we have had $2 billion in deposits that have come in through these accounts already. Uh, what is the Russian digital account? I think if I can just explain it to you in, uh, in sort of three main dimensions, the first thing is that for the first time in Pakistan's history, and indeed this doesn't happen very often in any country in the world, we now have a way of opening an account in Pakistan that doesn't require you to come physically to Pakistan. It also doesn't require you to visit any bank branch physically or even come to the embassy or the consulate. You can just do this sitting at home. If you have access to the internet, it's a very simple, a relatively simple form that you have to fill out. It takes about 20, 25 minutes. You can scan a few documents, do it all yourself, you don't have to attest it or anything. And if you've done everything right, you will have the account open in Pakistan within 48 hours. And 200,000 people, as I said, have already done this, so it's working quite well now. Um, the account is available either in Pakistani rupees or in any of the major uh, uh, currencies of the world, including the US dollar, Canadian dollar, uh, Saudi real, UAE dirham, Australian dollar. I mean, pretty much all the currencies of the world. You can open the account in a conventional form or an Islamic form if you want. And we found that the Islamic option has actually been quite popular among the diaspora. And as I said, if you've got everything uh, ready, it can be open in 48 hours. You can have an account in Pakistan. So opening the account has been made much easier. You don't have to physically go anywhere. You can just do it from your living room or your office, wherever you have access to it. The second main feature of the account is that once you've opened the account, you have access to a range of lifestyle products in Pakistan in terms of banking activities that you can do. And I'll talk about that in a second. But in particular, we have something called the Naya Pakistan Certificate, which is a government security available at short tenors as well as longer tenors that offer very, very good returns. And I'll talk about the returns in a second. In addition to that, you can also invest in the Pakistani stock market, which has been doing very well. Uh, for the last 10 or 15 years, including through COVID. And uh, this week, we will also be launching a new product called Russian Apna Ghar, 
So you'd be able to get mortgage financing if you want to get a house in Pakistan for your relatives or for yourself. Or if you want to buy a property outright, you'd be able to do that through the Russian digital account. And third, the most important probably part of uh, the account is that the account is fully repatriable. So often people in, uh, that live outside Pakistan, and I myself was an overseas Pakistani until uh, a year and a half ago, they're afraid that if they send money to Pakistan, they will not be able to get the money out. Right? It's easy to send the money in, but when you want to get your money out, you want to repatriate it back to where you live, typically you have problems in the past. The Russian digital account solves that problem. It's a fully repatriable account, which means that the same ease with which you sent the money into the account in the first place, you can actually get your money out without any hassle. The bank won't ask you any questions. The state bank won't ask you any questions. It's your account. You're free to use it anyway. So those are the three main features that I want you to, to remember. Yes, sir. Um, let me just say three other things I think that are important to know. One is um, the, the tax treatment of these accounts has been made very, very simple. I think people in, uh, that live outside Pakistan are mortally afraid of the FBR, which is the IRS equivalent of, of Pakistan. Uh, you won't have to deal with them uh, for your Russian digital account. You won't need to file any tax returns. Everything will be deducted full and final at the time in which you're making your investments to the Russian digital account. You don't have to worry about filing the tax return, and, and you won't have to deal with the FBR. Uh, the second important thing is that People were complaining before that when they were transferring money from outside into these accounts, sometimes the transfer charges were quite high, 40 to $60 per transaction. We've been able to work with the Pakistani banks and their correspondent banks so that now the charges that will be um, uh, uh, applied to your transactions will basically be in single digits most of the time. There may be some exceptions if the correspondent bank isn't one of the ones that we've worked with. So we've worked with JP Morgan, we've worked with Credit Suisse, we've worked with Standard Chartered. Citibank, they have committed to keeping the transfer charges to within single digits. The third important thing is this is an account for everyone. It can, it's an account for people who are employed, self-employed. Minors can also open it jointly with uh, adults. You know, if, if you've got a homemaker at home, they can also open the account. They just have to show where the money is coming from. And also people who retire can open this account. So it really is an account for everyone. Okay. So once you open the account, as I said, you can do a variety of things. The most simple thing you can do top left hand side is you can start to pay bills for your families in Pakistan. If you have a parent that lives in Pakistan, you have children that live in Pakistan, you have cousins, aunts, you want to pay their utility bills, you want to pay their school bills, you can do that through the Russian digital account. You can send them gifts, you can do e-commerce, and you will get an ATM card, a debit card that you can use both here as well as in Pakistan. Uh, the second thing that you can do, if you go down the list on the left hand side, you can invest in stocks. Uh, it's very easy to do that. I'll show you that in a, in a minute. You can invest in equities on the Pakistan Stock Exchange, in exchange traded funds, mutual funds, even REITs are coming through. Third thing is that you can get a car for your family in Pakistan at a very, very low markup rate. So the interest rate on the loan will be as low as 7%. Uh, you can also get Sharia financing if that's, what you, uh, if that's how you want to transact. And the delivery time of the car has been cut to 50% for people that have a Russian digital account. Now if you look on the, uh, the right-hand side, uh, a very, very, I think, attractive investment opportunity is the Naya Pakistan Certificate. It's, it's a government bond. It offers risk-free rates on both Pakistani rupee bonds or foreign currency bonds, and I'll talk about that in a minute. In a minute. Going down, uh, Roshan Apnaghar will be launched by the Prime Minister this week. It, as I said, will offer you the opportunity as an overseas Pakistani to buy a property in Pakistan, either outright or to get a mortgage for it. It can be residential property, it can be commercial property. And lastly, I think something that um, uh, has just taken off, and uh, we, we, are, we, are, we are very hopeful that this will also give opportunities for people who want to give zakat in Pakistan, who want to donate to charities, schools, hospitals, and also contribute to the ASAS program that I was talking about, the social safety net program that the government has launched which is really helping the disadvantage. If you want to do that, you can also do that through Russian digital. That's all right. So these are the numbers. Uh, we, uh, since we started the Russian digital account initiative about 11 months ago, accounts have been opened from 175 countries. Uh, 212,000 plus accounts have been opened, and we have got deposits of over $2 billion so far. This is just showing you how things have progressed since September, as you can see. 
uh, these bars are the cumulative uh, numbers of accounts that have been opened. Through, this is the data through July, of course, uh, you know, you know, in August. And the numbers on top of the bars just to tell you the number of accounts that were opened in that particular month. So you can see that the pace has accelerated quite a bit since March or April. That's what I mentioned. Um, these are the deposits that have come in to the accounts. Again, you can see since March, we have seen quite healthy numbers. And more recently, we've seen numbers in the $300 million range every month. So every month, we're getting, every day, we're getting about eight to $10 million that are coming in through these accounts. And every day, we're getting about 800 to 1,000 accounts. How are these funds being used? Uh, so far, about 30% are account balances, transactions, people that are using them in Pakistan to pay, pay bills. 41% is the Naya Pakistan certificate. About 30% is the Islamic version of the Naya Pakistan certificate. 1% and half a percent are going into stock market and real estate, respectively. We hope those numbers will go up because we're launching new products for that. And in terms of amounts that have been repatriated out of Pakistan back to where the accounts were, uh, where the overseas Pakistani lived, about $35 million have actually left Pakistan as well. So let me just tell you quickly, how, how do you actually open uh, one of these accounts? As I said, we've, we've tried to streamline, streamline the process quite a bit. The first thing you can do is you can visit the State Bank website. If you go to the State Bank website, you type State Bank of Pakistan in Google. It will take you to our homepage, and on our homepage, you will see very prominently one of the banners that's right on the homepage, very bright, flashy uh, banner, will be for the Russian digital account. If you click on that, you get all the information about the account. The, the State Bank website is just an information website, uh, and it can direct you to the website of, of 12 of the participating banks. So these are the banks that are participating with us in the Russian digital account initiative. We chose them very carefully. We didn't include all the banks of Pakistan yet because we wanted to concentrate on those that were able to provide a first-class online banking experience. Uh, and also those that have a, pro a prominent uh, a presence uh, overseas. So as you can see, you can open it with Habib Bank, Bank Al-Fala, UBM, Mizan, Standard Chartered, Samba Bank, Muslim Commercial Bank, MCB, Faisal Bank, Habib Metro, Bank Al-Habib, Dubai Islamic Bank, Bank of Punjab, any of these banks. You can either go directly to their websites. If you type Russian digital account, HBL, for example, it'll take you to that uh, website. You can start the process there. Or you can go through our website. It gives you all the information first. You click on one of the logos. It takes you to the website to start opening the account. Have you uh, How do you, what kind of information will you need? On the left-hand side, we have worked with the bank so to try to streamline the kind of information that they're asking. So, uh, it's very basic information, so of course, who you are, your mother's maiden name, date of birth. The thing to remember is that this account can be opened by an overseas Pakistani who's non resident. What does that mean? It means that either you should have a what we call a NICA, or you can have a Pakistan origin card, or you can have or you can have a regular Pakistani passport, but you have to demonstrate that you have spent more than 180 days outside Pakistan. In fact, even uh, members of the embassies, the consulates can open, can open these accounts. Uh, then again, just going, make, going down the list, you have to show what kind of nationalities you have, email address, phone number, very, very simple thing. One thing that I will point out is number 10, which is important in the, in, in the, uh, in the US context, because there's, there's a regulation that requires you in America to declare all the bank accounts that you have outside. And so that's FATCA, as you have to do that as well. You, you give your profession, source of your income, and the existing bank details uh, that you have, including the one from where the account will be funded. So it's all very simple, not very complicated at all. What, what documents will you need? You need to prove that you're an overseas Pakistani, so you can either scan your NICOP, your Pakistan origin card, CNIC, you can scan your passport if that's what you have. If, if, you, if you have just a Pakistani passport, then you have to prove that you've spent more than 180 days outside Pakistan. You can do that with the visa entry exit stamps. That's number three. Uh, you have to prove your profession. Uh, you can do that using a variety of documents. For example, if you're a business, you can show a business registration document, you can show a bank account statement, employment records, family very, very sort of simple things. You'll be asked to take a live photo, that's also very regular now, and also a signature to be digital signature as well. So those are the things that you need to keep with you. You can scan these things and send them across. And as I said, if you filled everything in correctly, then within 48 hours, you should be able to have an account. Let me talk about the Naya Pakistan certificate because I think this really is a 
product that um, I think is very, very attractive, for, especially for the overseas Pakistanis. Uh, as I said, it is a government bond. It's available at flexible tenors. You can either invest for three, six, or 12 months. Or if you want to lock in the interest rates for longer, you can actually invest for three years or five years as well. You can also in cash early. So for example, if you had initially invested in the five year, but after four years you want your money back, you basically just get the interest rate on the three year, but you will be able to in cash early. Uh, the returns uh, are very attractive. As you can see, depending on what tenor uh, security you've invested in, the US dollar is between five and a half and 7%. And then you've also got returns if you want to invest instead in the British pound, the Euro, or in the Pakistani rupee. Pakistani rupee is between 9.5% and 11%. These are all annualized rates. If you compare this to the kind of interest rates you're getting probably on your bank accounts here in the US, these are you know, orders of magnitude better. Now, we often get the question, well, how would you actually be able to fund this? How would you actually be able to give these kind of returns? The answer is that we're already giving these returns. It's been 11 months. People have already invested in the Pakistan certificate. Some at three, six, 12 month frequencies, and they have already received these returns. And I'll talk a little bit more about why fundamentally this is not a bad deal for the Pakistani government, uh, also if people are interested. But those are the returns, as you can see, very, very uh, uh, attractive. Uh, the tax is very simple. There'll be a 10% withholding tax on the profit applied uh, at source. You don't need to do any tax filing. So what does that mean? It basically means that if you've invested in the five year US dollar version of the Nea Pakistan certificate. Before tax, you get 7%, 10% uh, uh, gets deducted, so you get 6.3%. That's how you should think about it. That's how the 10% works. Similarly, and last thing, um, if you're more interested in going down the Sharia compliant route, you can also get Islamic Nea Pakistan certificates, which offer returns that are in similar uh, region. Of course, with the Islamic Nea Pakistan certificates, you can't guarantee a return. But so far, the returns have been very close to these numbers if you're more interested in the Islamic versions of these things. Uh, Roshan Apna Ghar, which is going to be launched by the Prime Minister this week. Uh, let me just very quickly tell you about it. You can either purchase property outright in Pakistan. Uh, you can uh, rent out the property. You can repatriate your principal anytime. But if you've made any capital gain on this investment, you have to wait three years until you can get the capital gain part. And that, of course, makes a lot of sense. You don't want people to just be going in and coming out very quickly. But the principle can be repatriated. And the capital gain can be used within Pakistan for those three years. If you want to invest, for example, in Islamic Nea Pakistan certificate, you can do that. But after three years, you can also repatriate your capital gain once you've sold. Uh, you can also, if you prefer not to buy but to get a mortgage, you can, you can do that as well. Uh, fixed and variable rate mortgages are available between 8 and 11% in, in Pakistani rupees. 25 years. You can also get Sharia compliant financing. Uh, a lot of people are sometimes uh, overseas Pakistanis not sure about the quality or the uh, authenticity of some of the properties mm -hmm. developers. You will now have a pre screened list that every bank will give you so you can have more confidence in, in investing in those housing projects. We have collaborated with housing societies, with builders, with developers, and with the Naya Pakistan Housing uh, uh, Authority. NAPTA in Pakistan, and it's very convenient. It's basically a fully digital journey with very simple uh, documentation. What we will ask, of course, is that you have a local uh, co applicant who is able to do some of the running around for you. So you can either be a relative or a lawyer, if you want, who will be able to fill out some of the documentation for you. So this will be launched, uh, inshallah, uh, later this week by the Prime Minister. The other, I think, uh, very uh, good product that is available through the Russian digital account. Is a, uh, is a car loan that we call it Roshan e car. And you can see on the right hand side that its features are much better than the traditional car loans that you get in Pakistan. Much cheaper interest rate, much lower insurance rate. You can get up to three cars, much faster processing, and a very quick delivery relative to what people have to face right now in Pakistan about 50% car. Uh, if you want to invest in the Pakistan stock market, which has been doing very, very well in the last so 10 or 15 years, that's also very easy. I won't go through all the steps, but basically at the time of opening the Russian digital account, or even afterwards, if you want to also have a, a brokerage account, you can do that. You can just fill a, fill, a, fill a, you can just tick a box, and basically all your information will be passed on to the stock exchange. You don't have to fill out another form or anything like that. 
you can pick a broker, you can buy sell stocks just like you do here in the US. And again, you can repatriate any time. You can make money, you want to repatriate. And then we have a Roshan Samaji Khidmat, which is the one stop portal for charitable giving. If you want to give your zakat in Pakistan, you want to donate to uh, health or education. Uh, Dr. Vasilah was saying that you know, human capital is very important in Pakistan. This is one of the ways in which you can invest. For example, the Citizens Foundation, Shafat Khan and Mahakam. You have the uh, charities also that are doing very good work in Pakistan. Or for the first time as a private citizen, you can also participate in the government's SAS program if you want to do that. Uh, how do we make sure at the state bank that things are going well? We have a very intensive monitoring mechanism. This hasn't been one of those initiatives where we've just launched it and we've forgotten about it. We're actually following it up every day. We ask the banks to report to us uh, every day on the number of accounts that they've opened, the time that it took to open the account, any complaints that they're seeing. And over time, we've actually been able to get over many of the teething problems that first occur with any new initiative. And now, as I said, more than 20,000 accounts have been opened, people are moving money back and forth. Uh, on the right-hand side, you can see that we also have a dedicated monitoring team in the State Bank. That's the email address that you can also write to if you've got any problems with your account or any questions. RDA support at sbp.org.uk. There are also pamphlets uh, sort of on that table as you, as you go out. I would encourage you to pick it up if you don't want to write down the email address right now. It has all the details on both the Russian digital account as well as the mailbox certificate. We also regularly meet with the CEOs every month, the governor, convenes a meeting, we talk about how it's going, uh, any help that they need from the State Bank, and we exchange new ideas for how to make this even better for all these Pakistanis. We have focus groups, you know, meetings like these are very useful because they can give us ideas. What are, what, what, what are your needs as overseas Pakistanis? What else would you like to see? Uh, for example, one of the things that we are planning to do in the next phase is to also offer a platform through the Russian Digital Account for people to invest in startups and things or to invest in other sectors of the economy. Somebody was asking about tourism. This could be one way in which you could invest in Pakistan. We would give you a list of the companies. Uh, we would give you their financials. And if you were interested in, in sort of uh, having an investment opportunity that way, you could do it. So that's the end of the presentation. That's the website again on the left-hand side, but uh, and the, and the uh, email address that we have at uh, the State Bank. But again, all of that information is in the pamphlet, so I would encourage you to actually pick it up. Let me just end, and then of course we can open it uh, for questions. Mm -hmm. by, by making a request, actually, one of the uh, um, mm -hmm. obstacles that we have right now is that mm -hmm. this is an in initiative that we've started in Pakistan, but our clientele, our audience is outside Pakistan. And so the more that people know about this, the more that uh, they know about this particular investment opportunity, this bank account opportunity in Pakistan, the better it's going to be for us. So I would encourage you, I would, I would, I would uh, request all of you, if you haven't opened your Russian digital account yet, please try to do so. Hopefully you'll have a very good experience. Even if you don't, please write to us and we will make sure that any problems you have are addressed. And if you have a good experience, tell a few friends about it as well. I think that's the way this thing starts to, 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 to spread. And I will also say that uh, Pakistan will just be joining the ranks of many other countries that have used their diaspora. Mm -hmm. And there have been a number of countries that have been able to offer investment opportunities to the diaspora that have been mutually beneficial, both for the diaspora as well as for the country. And uh, I will just end by saying that uh, the Prime Minister, when he says that overseas Pakistanis are our, our greatest asset, he really means it. And I think like Dr. Vasila was saying as well in his remarks, if we can have more exchange, either of capital or of human resources between countries like America and Pakistan, I think it will be mutually beneficial for both sides. So thank you very much. Sorry, I went on a little bit longer than I anticipated, but very happy to take all, all of your questions. I can be here for as long as you want. Please. I have a question regarding your uh, rate of return. You said uh, you are guaranteeing you five to seven percent, and nowhere in the world, in the established uh, economy, you can get a return like this. I can borrow at two percent from here, and I can invest with you to seven percent, and I can make. Uh, 5% by doing nothing. So could, could you explain me how could you give me 7%? <clears throat> it's a very good question. Um, my, my answer, I'll have two or three answers. But one is that we're already giving 7% because people are getting 7%, right? So the first thing is that there's a proof of concept that's already out there. We are giving it. 
The second thing is that if Pakistan goes out to borrow from international markets right now, for example, the euro bond that we floated a few months ago, we had to pay five and a half, six percent for that, right? So Pakistan, unfortunately, is not like a developed country. Right? Most emerging markets, when they try to tap the international markets for funds, they have to pay a certain premium because you know there is some sovereign risk attached to the country. So my my answer to you is that for the euro bonds, we had to pay five and a half to six percent for our overseas Pakistanis as a way of thanking them for all the you know, help that they've been giving Pakistan for so many years now, we wanted to offer a little bit of a sweet, right? And the five and a half to six percent that we're paying to Eurobond investors that are not Pakistanis, we wanted to offer a one percentage point extra to our overseas Pakistanis. Now, the way we fund this is by having foreign exchange in Pakistan. How do we get foreign exchange in Pakistan? Through our reserves, through export, through remittances. As I told you, I think, I, I think you were there at the beginning as well, uh, Pakistan reserves, international reserves, will be at $20 billion in the, next, in the next few years. That's the highest we've ever had, right? That's one of the ways in which you pay these kind of debts. The, the, the better way that over time we will get there is to do it through exports. And that is where I think the next phase, you will see the next five years, there's going to be a lot of emphasis now in Pakistan on trying to grow out our export base. Part of it will be IT. The other part will be these special economic zones in the China-Pakistan economic corridor. But to me, I think, uh, there is no reason why Pakistan cannot also become a major force in terms of exports in the next five to ten years. We have a very cheap uh, labor force. We are well connected, and I think some of the ancient roots that I think Mr. Lipinski is an expert on, the Silk Roots, are beginning to be revived now. As you can see, Central Asia, China, Pakistan, India, Iran—these links that used to exist for many, many centuries before uh, the last two or three hundred years—some of those are coming back. And you will see, I think, that Pakistan is very well placed and also tap into that. So your question is a very valid one. But um, the way I answer it is that we now have much higher level of reserves to be able to pay this kind of thing. And we also will uh, have exports coming on. But you know, really, I still not get the, the answer of my question. If you have to pay me 5 to 7%, and after that, uh, that is after the administrative cost. You must invest my money somewhere where you will make more than that money, five to five to seven percent plus that. So where, what kind of investments you have available where you are investing it? If you are taking my fund uh, money from these funds and you are replacing from the, the money you are going to borrow from international sources, which are uh, not lending you less than uh, five or six percent more than the current market rate. The reason they are uh, charging you more rate because you are a bad risk. If you are a bad risk and they are charging you uh, a premium for that risk, and you are also paying me a premium because you are a bad risk. <coughs> Now you tell me if you are a bad risk, should uh, I invest in you? So first thing is that five and a half to six percent doesn't mean you're a bad risk. It means you're a risk. You're certainly more of a risk than the U.S. is. The U.S. is the lowest risk, right, globally. If you invest in a U.S. T-bill, you know you're going to get paid. Right? In Pakistan's case, of course we are a risk, but so are almost all emerging markets. Almost all emerging markets have to pay way more than zero percent, half a percent, one percent, the U.S. has to pay. So all countries that are not the U.S., and as you go down the ladder, of course, moving away from developed countries, they are a risk. Your question is a good one. Where are we going to invest this money? Where are we going to get the returns? So this is where the government is betting that the infrastructure that it's trying to develop in through CPEC, the exporting zones that it's trying to develop, the IT infrastructure that it's trying to develop, the business regulations that it is trying to make easier will generate the kind of economic activity that will generate dollars for us to be able to pay this back on a sustainable basis. Right now we can pay it back because we have reserves. But if you're talking about five years, 10 years, 20 years down the line, if we still have you know, products like these, of course we will need to have our exports firing. And that's what the government is focused on. It knows that Pakistan cannot continue with this kind of growth model anymore. One that is very heavily driven by imports is just not a sustainable model for Pakistan. So the government is now fully focused I'm trying to get exports to rise. So I have another question. He said, Nia Pakistan. Yeah, Pakistan may be Nia, but the characters are the same old characters. 
Yeah, I'll bail you out. I'll ask yes, another question. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry about that. No, no, it's uh, okay. <clears throat> do you have any particular platform where, like, you know, India has got global India fund, opportunity growth fund by investment bankers like Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan's of the world? Have we tried to tap into those resources? So, you know, we now have a finance minister who is a banker. We have Shokat in uh, he's very keen to actually start some funds like, like these private equity funds, funds that invest in infrastructure. So I think you will see some announcements from, from that fund. He's thinking about it very much now from a um, business perspective. What do businesses need? What do overseas Pakistan need to feel comfortable about investing in Pakistan? And funds of the kind that you are talking about are on his mind as well. So you will see it in the next few months. I think it's going to be a timeline for that. I think it's coming very soon. He's a man who is very, um, uh, you know, he's a very action-oriented, dynamic sort of personality. And you will see some announcements very soon. Thank you. A couple of questions. Uh, for us, stock market investment is only one percent. What are your plans over there? Uh, second, related to tax. How stock market capital, stock capital gains that you see stock market are uh, withheld by the broker. Are we going to get the reporting from there? What kind of reports are you going to provide to U.S. investors? Are there investors because they have to report to IRS? Because I don't think there's a treaty between India and between Pakistan and U.S. So what are what are the forms available to us to the investors at the end of the year? What are the general to the IRS? Right. So on the stock market side, first of all, you said how are we going to get more funds to start flowing yeah. in? So <clears throat> we launched the Russian digital account. We had this uh, equity uh, opportunity <laughs> embedded in the Russian digital account. It just was not very well advertised. So we've now rebranded it. We call it Russian Equity Investment. And we've asked the banks to work with the brokers to try to advertise it better. Because if you take a look, and I'll, I'm happy to send you more information on this. If you look at the last 10 years and how the stock market has performed in Pakistan, it's actually done very, very well. I yeah, I've worked in Pakistan. Right. So you know, I'm, so you and I've worked with international investors in investing in Pakistan. So you know, you know the bank. Right? It's, it's a good investment opportunity. Now, in terms of the capital gains, it'll be 15 percent. Uh, we've, 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 uh, Which is withheld by the broker, right? Which is withheld by the broker, and that's again for a Russian digital account holder, you don't have to file a tax return in Pakistan. Pakistan. Right. How about here? Over here, actually, maybe you can tell me, how does how does it work here? Like, what do you have so to if do? I'm invested in the broker, if I have an E-Trade account, a TD Ameritrade account, they, can be, they, give, they send me the statement. No, no, sorry. I, no, just I meant that how would it work when, when you've invested in Pakistan uh, through the Russian digital account? What happens? What kind of documentation do you need to show the IRS? Here? We need to show to IRS how much money I made, how did I make that money. Yes. Right? Yes. What is my realized gain? What is my, of course, not an unrealized gain. What's my dividend? So all of that documentation should be made available to you by your stock broker in Pakistan. So how is it different from if we work in Pakistan and we are expatriates? A lot of them file returns, so I am sure they can file returns like that because you know there's a certain amount which is waived if you work in Pakistan and in America. And a lot of physicians are working in Pakistan. No, here, yeah, in IRS. Yeah, yeah. They, they submit IRS uh, documentation that that's their income. In and there's a the certain world. level where they don't charge you any uh, taxes, and above that, they do charge you taxes. But it, that's, that's not a stock investment. That's not equity. It's different than investment. Yeah, but probably CPS can help, help us out. With Actually, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, I think it could be the I'm same way like we, we do the trading here. Because if I'm... If I'm because if I'm trading here, we get a tax return. We get a statement. Asif Sahib, he's a CPA. Yeah. Asif Sahib, he's a CPA. Yeah. Yeah. So you report in. So whatever interest you make, so 6.3% yeah. will be your interest. You're going to report it. Yeah. The interest yeah. income yeah. from Pakistan. 15% right. mm -hmm. capital gain. Let's say you make $15,000. Whether it's short term or long term, mm -hmm. you report it mm -hmm. in your tax return. Mm -hmm. whatever the because you have a broker statement. Now you're going to report it in the U.S. tax return. That's what I'm saying. There should be a broker statement that you get from your team. But you will get it because they are charging you 15% tax. Right. And you can take that 15% deduction in the U.S. return. So I have a question. I think, what, I think what we can do is that we can have a bunch of questions. There are more people. I think the better is that to generate discussion. And you can be able to respond to a question. Maybe uh, many people will be asking the same sort of questions. So I think so there was a hand up here. Yeah. So you can... Uh,
think we'll do a bunch of three yeah. questions. Yeah, three, four, yeah. four, four, four questions. Four. Yeah. Welcome to our town of Chicago. I've been in the city of Chicago for almost 50 years and, and belongs to the Mimin community from Karachi. I took, for many years, in the last 50 years, I've taken big investment back to Pakistan. Big amount. One time I had a big account there in uh, Pakistan, and then Nawaz Sharif uh, government forfeited my account and gave me very small chunk of money related to my account. Then in 1998-99, uh, uh, President Musharraf Sharif was here, and he said we're going to do a seminar in Islamabad. Uh, all five or six business uh, gentlemen went with me. We went to Islamabad. Three days seminar by President Musharraf and Shaukat Aziz. And one day they said, Bring all the money, like you're doing it, bring it all the money to our Pakistan, we're we'll gonna do this, we'll do that. And this was two days. Second day, a guy from Japan came up with this big fight. He said, My properties are here, they're occupied by all these people. Can you tell me? And no, out of the Musharraf and Shaukat Aziz, not a single word came from that, that they could do that. So I have, I have roughly right now 25 to 30 crore rupees in Karachi right now. And I'm trying to go out and take more money in Pakistan, but who's going to guarantee my investment? Are you going to guarantee that? Yes. That my investment will be furthermore safe if I invest in tourist industries, if I invest in all other industries, Right now, we, we sell our real estate, and he said, 30 rupees, but then they, they said, this is black money, this is white money, still the things are going just like that. In America, everything is clear, black and white. In Pakistan, still things are running like that. How are you going to answer all these questions? And the people are listening. So you have to answer all that. Thank you. I think we we'll take two or three more. Yeah. And then I'll, I'll, I'll I think uh, also Sheen Saab, Professor Lipinski, and the back, back of them. Well, I could not question the comment. Uh, talking about banks that uh, present 5 to 10% interest, Azerbaijan, a couple other countries, they're doing high ruler, high risk. 5 to 10%. <laughs> uh, but, uh, I think you will. Uh, it's true that in, in dollar terms, to offer this kind of returns is, is fairly attractive. But maybe these are in local currency, I would have thought about 10%, but I'm not sure. But I, I think 7% 7, 7 which we are offering in Pakistan is right up there in terms of dollar returns. So maybe the 5 to 10% is in local currency return, perhaps, although I'm not sure about it. It varies. This is near Pakistan certificates. Uh, how safe it is uh, to, to buy those? Uh, is this the guarantees by the this, uh, state bank of Pakistan or the government of Pakistan? I'll answer that as well. And then, second part will be exactly the money which we, uh, we take it in dollars and buy the you know, Pakistan certificate. What is the guarantee that are uh, you know, going down the time like it will be converted into Pakistan be as it does in the past? Okay, so first of all, welcome to our beautiful city, Chicago, we call home. But we live here for a long time, but we still, our heart is in Pakistan. So we want to do anything to make uh, whatever progress we can get in Pakistan. As myself, like a stock trader, I have lost a lot, lot of money in the stocks, so that's like personal experience. So my question is, uh, is it... It's not clear, probably in my mind, like it's, a, it's not a stock, it's a certificate. So it's a bond, like, so everybody's worried about the, how much is secure. So if it's a certificate, it should be secure because it's not a stock. So what is the difference, if you could explain that? Sure. I'll answer that as well. Should we take one more and then I'll try Yeah, I think, uh, who is behind, Mr. Lipensky? I think. I'll come to you. My question wasn't about the financial side, the recruitment, you know, desired talent acquisition pro process in Pakistan. You know, it's hard to recruit desired field people, student center in Pakistan, right? So it becomes, I mean, you teach them first trade of here and then, you know, language barrier and all that. So 
is it a you know from Imran Khan side it should be for you know some centralized from universities or schools centralized training centers for them to be trained for call centers or for billing or X Y Z thing should be designed some setup so we can you know hire easily that talent and filtered people rather than you know just training one after the other. So you had a question as well? Did you have a question? I did not. You did. Let's take one more. I have two short questions I would like to short answer in our discussion. First one is you have Pakistan has loans from international banks. What is the current interest rate Pakistan is paying to those banks? Second is people are willing to invest into Pakistan. What guarantee can state bank provide that this money will not be diverted to pay the loans? So on the, on, now let me try to answer an obvious. So I think one theme that's emerging is this theme of, um, can you guarantee that 1998 will not be repeated? Can you guarantee my investments more generally? Um, you had a question about how this is different from stocks, it's the same thing. So let me just build up. So first of all, there is an opportunity to invest in stocks to the Russian digital account, but that is called Russian equity investment. So that's all risky, you know, if you lose money, you know, that's just the nature, as you said, you've lost or lost money in stocks. Stocks are, that's the nature of stocks, right? You're taking some risk. The next level of risk you can take is real estate. There too, you could make money, you could not make money. You have to do your research, you have to go in. You have to start. The Nea Pakistan certificate is actually a government bond. So it's like a T-bill, if you will. It's like a US Treasury bill issued by, of course, the government of Pakistan. It's not issued by the state bank. So the guarantee is coming from the government of Pakistan, not from the state. Yeah, that's, 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 that's where the problem comes in. Right. No, no. But people are asking guarantee from the state bank sure, rather than government. Sure, sure. So let me, let, let me. So the state bank, unfortunately, look, cannot offer these kind of guarantees. What are we? We are a central bank. We are like the Federal Reserve, <coughs> right? Because this is a USD bill, the, US, the, the, central, the Federal Reserve does not give you a guarantee on the USD bill. The government has done it, right, in the US. So it's the same thing. This is a government bond. Now, Let's, now let me try to answer the question of uh, 1998, how can we be sure this is not going to happen again? Uh, 1998 happened under a very specific set of circumstances. If you remember, Pakistan had just uh, uh, conducted nuclear tests, and then the whole, uh, uh, much of the, the world had imposed sanctions on Pakistan. It became a very dire situation. Dire situation called for dire uh, choices to be made. Unfortunately, one of the choices that had to be made was to freeze accounts, uh, including foreign currency accounts. What is different now? Three things I would say. One is that we have a law now in Pakistan, which was promulgated in 2001, called the Foreign Currency Deposit Protection Ordinance. It basically makes it illegal to do a repeat of 1998. You just can't do it anymore by law. And indeed, since 1998, we have never had a repeat of it. Anybody who has a foreign currency account in Pakistan has always been able to use their accounts without any problem since 2001, in fact, since 1998, since that uh, unfortunate event happened. Second thing I would say is that, look, countries also learn from their mistakes. I think there is widespread recognition across political parties that that was a mistake. You know, you burnt people, uh, and then to try to entice them to come again, you have to pay a premium now, because you already did that once. So I think across the political spectrum, there is widespread recognition that we should not do this again because it was a very costly experience. 25 years later, we're still talking about it. That was how costly it was, right? So we don't have to, we, do, we shouldn't go back there again. The last way to answer the question is that fundamentally the, the condition of the economy is much different now. In 1998, we had a ridiculous set of circumstances that happened, our reserves had gone down. I will tell you that as an investor, you should look at you know, two or three things in Pakistan to make sure that things are going okay. One is the current account deficit, which I think somebody had asked, for, uh, asked about. If that starts to get very large, in Pakistan's case, you know, more than about 3% of GDP, which is about $10 billion. If it starts to become larger than that, start to worry a little bit. Okay, if it becomes $20 billion, like it was in 2017, 18, get very worried, because that is very, very, it's a dangerous level of current account deficit. Second thing you should get worried about is if the, our international reserves start to fall very, very sharply. You know, in three years ago, our reserves were seven billion dollars. Today, they'll be twenty billion dollars, three times that. So, as long as those things are not happening, there shouldn't be any problem with uh, being able to repay 
And I think somebody had asked, said, I want very simple on, uh, questions, uh, answers to my questions. How much are we paying right now? It's, it's between five and a half and six percent typically on what we are paying for our euro bond. Uh, and I think there was a second part of that question again. Sorry, which you wanted a simple answer to, but I forget what the question was. Uh, second so part about, that it's not being about, used for about the guarantee that the money will be not be diverted by the government into paying the international loan, which are hefty. Right. Well, you know, on that. Ultimately, money is fungible, right? So I don't think anybody can give you a guarantee. Like if I give you a hundred bucks and I ask you what you spend it on, then you could be spending it on all, all, all kinds of things. So I don't think you'll get a guarantee as such, but what you will get is a promise or I think a, a commitment to managing the macro economy better going forward, to being able to pay back these debts, right? Without having to go back to the IMF time and time again. And as I said, the way to look at that is to look at what's happening to your reserves what's happening to your current account deficits, are your exports going up over time or not? It's not something you can turn a switch on and have exports suddenly grow you know, a few months from now, but certainly the trend, you can start to see things sort of falling into place. So I would say that um, you know, there is a commitment now, I think, uh, this government certainly has, but I think across the political spectrum now, that Pakistan's uh, future uh, will have to uh, entail much better integration with the rest of the I think for a long time, especially since 1998, we have basically become a little bit cut off from the world. Partly it was because of security reasons in Afghanistan and all that. But I think over time, given that we have a very hungry young population that wants to be part of the world, you will find increasingly that we will be part of global value chains, we will be part of exporting uh, uh, value chains. And Pakistan will begin to punch at, at, at its uh, your correct, correct uh, level. Right now, we're the fifth largest country in the world, but we're punching way below our limit. And I think over time, you will find that Pakistan will join you know, the, the rest of the world in terms of being integrated in terms of FDI, in terms of exports, in terms of human resources going back and forth. But for that, you need macro stability. If you don't have macro stability, no one's going to invest in the future. That's what the last three years have been about. And hopefully, the next few years are going to be about. So, Muntazar, there is no such thing as sovereign guarantees exist in Pakistan? No, there is a sovereign there guarantee. Is. By Pakistan government or by the Pakistan bank or any by other the institutions? Pakistan, so, yeah. the, the, the amount of money that you invest in the... Just to preserve yeah, the initial capital. In the Nair Pakistan certificate, that is a government security. That does carry the sovereign guarantee. Yeah. But that's our tension to the you know, performance of the exports, the, the, the monetary macroeconomy. God forbid something stumbles. All of you know, those then things, you don't all of those things are medium-term risks. Let me right say now. goodbye. <laughs> no, no, no. Right now, right now, what should give you confidence is the international reserves position. The fact that the exchange rate is now the shock absorber. Before, what used to happen? Our current account would get big. We would import much more than our exports. In any other country, your exchange rate would depreciate. So your exports become more competitive, imports become more expensive. In Pakistan, we had an obsession with keeping the exchange rate fixed. The only way you can do that if you're importing more than you're exporting is by using your reserves. Reserve stocks. That's true. We no longer have that mechanism. The exchange rate is moving up and down. Yeah, reserves so are going good up. Good progress has been made. That's yes, perfectly yes. fine. But I'm just trying to make sure that people do live with the confidence. You what know, I should say, what, sure I, what I would say to everyone actually is right. if, you, if you are very risk averse, and maybe there are reasons to be risk averse uh, because of the history of the country, I'll say two things. One is you can't, cannot progress if you keep looking back. If you keep looking back at your worst mistakes, yes. you'll never be able to fulfill your potential. The second thing I'll say is if you're very risk averse still, buy a three month near Pakistan certificate. Three months with the Kuchni Hoga, Pakistan. Three months ke liya plane, uske baad repatriate bhi get some confidence mm -hmm. that the system works. You know, we that's why we're for, for people who are very risk averse, you can invest at the shorter end of the curve. Right? And for those who want to lock in this great interest rate that you think is very good, you can invest for five years. And uh, but take a chance, because I think if you continue to be haunted by the past, I think then you are already hemorrhaging your progress. Right? Even as individuals, if we remember our worst mistakes and continue to be haunted by those, of course you should learn from them, and I think we are learning from them, but if you continue to have that bad soundtrack playing in your head every time you have to talk about the future, I think you are severely limiting your potential. Yeah, I think there was one last question there, yeah. Shoaib Bhai, and then we share. Sure. So, uh, okay. Second last question. <laughs> uh, my, my name is Shreya Babasi. I run a software company. We have about 400 developers in Lahore. 
Actually, my question, you know, a lot of this premise is based on kind of growing exports, right? Mm -hmm. And technology keeps getting talked about and numbers like 500,000 trained people get thrown around, which I don't believe, but that's a separate story. What are the projections, uh, uh, you know, for exports and particular technology exports over the next, let's say, five to 10 years? There was one more question we can take and then we can... Yes, my actual question was kind of a statement of the conversation I was hearing. Well, I'm a banker, so I asked this question to a banker, a friend of mine back home in Pakistan. What is the security and surety of our funds? And he gave me a very simple answer. He said, as long as Pakistan is on the map, your money is safe. <laughs> can I, can I just add, add to that? Because I work in Pakistan. Well, because, so, you know, the just two facts that will make some, uh, some things clear. Pakistan has never defaulted on any of its loans in 75 years. Right. Euro bond, recent Euro bond, was oversubscribed by three times or five times, I believe. Right. So international investor is running after Pakistan to invest money to get five, six percent. They're giving me seven percent. So think about it. They have never defaulted. We would never default because we have 20 billion dollars of yours. And if we do have, if the results go down, we have IMF. The comfort we have is this that they are at least you know, they will give us the I am and the European you know. <laughs> <laughs> No, but this is a very good point. I think look, I think people forget that um, history that both, both 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 points are good actually. One is that we actually never defaulted Pakistan never defaulted. Uh, we did do 1998, but that wasn't technically a default. And I think this is just the fact that we just very recently done a Euro bond, two point five billion dollars. And then we went back to the market to tap it again for another billion dollars. And both times, there was a lot of appetite. So, you know, as Pakistanis, we of course should be confident about our country's future. But even people that are not Pakistani are very happy to have a bit of skin in the game in Pakistan. And they like the returns, and they know that Pakistan is, you know, in terms of uh, being able to pay back its debts, it's basically a good, it's a good bet. Right? So I think that should also give you a lot of confidence. So you had a question more specifically about IT exports, right? About exports in general, so, so, so yeah, at, what, what the, are the projections? At the central bank, we tend to be a very conservative institution, and rightly so. So when we think about the future, we tend to sort of you know modulate our, our and so when we project, we project on the basis of history, on the basis of what we know now. Two or three things that are different that might give us a little bit more hope in terms of exports. One is that the exchange rate now is flexible. Sorry? The exchange rate is flexible. It used to be stuck at about 100 rupees per dollar. Now it's closer to 150, 160. That itself makes your exports more competitive, right? Just, just that, that the act of having depreciated closer to your fair value. The second thing is that these zones, please keep an eye out on them, these special economic zones with China, the technology parts with China. They're, they're, that, that, I think, is something that we didn't have before. Right? That is giving us a sort of a new uh, shot at becoming part of global value chains. Just keep an eye out on that. That's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to be something that you're going to see next month. But it's something that has potential. And I think thirdly is just that this whole, this is something that I was talking about before, the, the sense that the old roots that used to be very important to the global economy are kind of being revived. I mean, for want of a better term, these used to be called the Silk Roads before. Of course, that was for silk and that was totally different. But this whole corridor, Central Asia, Pakistan, Iran, uh, uh, China, India. This corridor has so many people, and the domestic market is so large there even, <coughs> that if this starts to get a little bit more traction, Pakistan is very well placed to, to be able to. Look, on the, you had some, uh, you know, I think you said you had some doubts about the numbers of uh, IT. That's fine, and I think, you know, you, you should be, you should ask a lot of questions. But at the same time, it is true that Pakistan has a very young population that is getting much more tech savvy than before. And you're having, you must have seen a couple of new tech startups in Pakistan that have done quite well in terms of. I See, I, I live in that space every day, right. right? I've invested a lot in Pakistani startups and non-Pakistani startups. Right. Challenge is, I think all of these investments are good, and I'm very supportive of that. Uh, challenge is we have a huge, you know, talent gap, right? And this isn't getting covered anytime soon, yeah. right? So we have a very young, illiterate population by my guesstimate, tier one graduates from computer science programs are less than 2,000 a year in Pakistan. Tier one, right? So these are people that I can hire and put on projects where we can earn 50, 60,000 
for head, you know, for someone based in Pakistan. It's a battle every day. The turnover right now is off the chart because that new money has come in, right? So people have raised money and now everyone is poaching everyone else's fee. People that we would pay, mm -hmm. let's say, 300,000 to, they are being offered 600,000. So that's, that's the reality. And this isn't going to get covered anytime soon, right? To get a computer science graduate, it's four years of college, plus at least four years of good high school, right? So we are talking eight years. And, and, and by the way, I truly appreciate your, you know, being courageous and standing in front of this crowd and crowds <laughs> like this all over. Uh, because, but I've seen, you know, I, in 2001, I was at an event for General Musharraf, right? There were people standing there talking about, we're going to have billion dollars of socks per export. And I'm like scratching my head, how, how are we going to do that, right? You know, now we are at two billion and I have, I'm skeptical about a lot of numbers. <laughs> but, so I think, you know, the, uh, the, if there is one message, right, which is we need to really, really invest in human capital. And that isn't happening, right? There was a news item about 80 million rupee uh, loan program, right, that uh, for graduate students that you can borrow interest rate. And if you think about it, that's a joke. That's $500,000, right? I mean, people in this room give more than that every year to educational institutions. So I think government needs to get serious about it rather than just talking about it. Mr. Kirby, I mean, one of the reasons why I'm able to stand here is because I used to be sitting there uh, not long ago because I, as I said, you know, I myself, look, all the questions today I think were very, very I think, uh, good questions and questions that I think are the right questions to be asking. But let me just end with sort of a pitch. Right? And the pitch is that there are not going to be any miracles overnight. It's going to be hard work. Uh, but if we don't stand up, we don't help our country at a time when you know, it needs a, needs a bit of help. And I think, uh, as I said, we are the fifth largest country in the world by population. That can either be a curse or it can be the greatest thing ever. But what really, I think, will help uh, determine which way we go is you very rightly pointed out human capital. And in fact, Dr. Mehmood Haq's name was invoked at the beginning. And Dr. Mehmood Haq was my first boss in Pakistan in the late 90s. Learned a lot from him. And I think. He was absolutely right, and the gentleman was absolutely right when he said that, and you are right, uh, that unless we really invest in education and health, um, uh, we're, we're not going to be able to take off. And so getting that right, getting the tax revenue to be able to fund that kind of thing is going to be important in Pakistan. It's a, it's a difficult journey. Um, I went back a year and a half ago, and in some ways, things are much worse than they were 20 years ago when I left. But then there are also ways of doing I think in particular the young population that is just hungry and needs to be equipped to join the sort of uh, uh, the rest of the world. I think that gives me hope. I hope all of you today also can take away some optimism. I think there is reason to be optimistic as well in Pakistan. And um, but you're right that you know if we just do business as usual, this thing we're never going to get there. And we should not also overplay, uh, you know, the, the, how, how quickly we're going to be able to. Turn things around, but certainly I think that um, we have an opportunity. I think we have a good government right now that at least is trying to do the right things. Um, and uh, I hope all of you today can at least try to open a Russian digital account if you're very risk averse, invest in a three month uh, certificate. But I can tell you that 200,000 people have already opened them and are happy with their experience. So <coughs> that, is, that also should give you confidence. Two billion dollars have come in, not a small amount of money for this. So, uh, I well, would like to thank all of you again for making time on uh, Monday uh, afternoon. I'd like to thank the Consulate, Consul General, Amir, Open, uh, the Vice Consul General, everybody who helped put this together, and really appreciate uh, your taking the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think there is uh, no, not much room for adding anything after that comprehensive discussions. Thank you, Mr. Sayyid Saab. I think. Uh, answering and responding to a broad range of questions. Um, I would say th uh, at the end, uh, thank you very thank much you for your uh, participation, interest, and very valuable contribution. The discussion was very frank. I think so many ideas came uh, out, and I think this would really help us in our broader uh, agenda how to really uh, uh, enhance this partnership. 
uh, just to uh, add two, three points uh, very briefly, uh, that since your uh, most of the customers related to the trust, and uh, yeah. I think you you had uh, uh, your own uh, different uh, context, and I think it's good too that you brought these things on the uh, in this forum. But one thing is clear that uh, uh, there is a uh, lot of trust that built of the overseas Pakistanis. You know, these steps are the part of government <coughs> overall agenda of facilitation of overseas Pakistanis. It's not just two billions uh, that are in the Russian digital account, but uh, as he mentioned, the 30 billion uh, in the remittances that have been received. So amid, in the midst of the pandemic, Pakistan's remittances from overseas Pakistanis are much more than export. There, there might be few examples in the world when you have remittances more than your exports. So I think uh, this, as far as the guarantee is concerned, uh, it is the state bank guarantee, is the government of Pakistan guarantee. And I think this one point. The second is that regardless of what, how much steps required to be done or what is more to be done, of course there is need. But there is an optimism, there is a transformation going on. And one overarching theme is the government approach from geopolitics to geoeconomics. And it is real, it is not just narrative building. It's a real, it's everywhere. And I would really uh, say you, you rethink about the, what the government has taken, the steps. They are very much focused uh, on the overseas Pakistanis. They are, as the Prime Minister himself said, they, you all are asset of Pakistan. You are already contributing a lot. Thank you very much. And on behalf of the Consulate General, I can say that we will look forward to very closely collaborate with you to further follow up on the ideas that emerged today. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.